screen now? Not yet, not yet. I, I'll tell you. So, hello everybody. Welcome to our new uh, seminar. So today, um, give me a sec. Today I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, uh, which is Dr. Will Grims. So uh, thanks, Will, for accepting our invitation to the Sussex Neuro Talk. Uh, it is a pleasure for us to have in a, a young investigator like you. And today, uh, Will will talk us uh, about an exciting uh, a new uh, research line he's developing at the lab of Professor Jeffrey Diamond. And uh, the title of his talk is, um, sorry, let me find it. Uh, he will be talking about uh, neurovascular interactions in the retina, in the mammalian retina. So I will give a, a, a brief um, introduction to the uh, Dr. Will Grimes. He did, um, sorry. He did uh, his PhD um, at the laboratory of Professor Jeffrey Diamond Sorry, I missed something. I missed the document. Um, sorry. Um, he did his PhD under the supervision of Professor Jeffrey Zyman at the University of Maryland. And his thesis was called uh, Dendritic Integration and Reciprocal Inhibition in the Retina. And then he moved to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute as a postdoctoral fellow uh, and in the University of Washington in the Department of Physiology and Biophysics, he uh, did her postdoctoral research under the supervision of Professor uh, Fred Rick. So uh, again, thanks a lot, Will, for uh, accepting our invitation and it is a pleasure for us to uh, shared with you or, or new discoveries in the field. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, uh, both Jose and uh, Tom Baden for uh, the invitation uh, and for just doing a wonderful job organizing this uh, worldwide neuro series that, uh, with the vision focus. This is just fabulous. Uh, so let me share my screen here. And... Um, my, my research career actually started in medium energy physics, believe it or not. And as I accepted a graduate position at the NIH to work in uh, the field of retinal neuroscience, I was very excited to learn about the biological light detectors and the bioelectric circuits within the eye that convey visual information onto the brain. And in the end, after spending a good number of years in the field, oops, uh, I came to appreciate a lot more than just that about the retina itself. Okay, the retina, retina is really a, a sort of a window into the brain. Uh, for those of you not uh, everyday familiar with the retina, uh, of course the visual images are coming through the cornea. The lens is focusing those images onto the retinal surface. You can see a sort of a blow up of the retinal tissue on the right hand side of the screen here. Uh, retina is a multi-layered structure with the photoreceptors on the back and several sets of synapses and neurons that ultimately uh, process this information and convert it into spike trains which are kicked out the optic nerve. And I've been in incredibly interested in the synaptic integration and dendritic integration properties of these neurons and how they contribute to visual processing. But today I'm gonna to talk about another system that's also present in the eye that makes, that's also similar to other brain regions. And that is the, the retina of humans and mice and other mammals is also vascular. And this vascular tissue 
uh, supports retinal function. And today I'm gonna talk about interactions between these two systems. And much of what I'm gonna be showing you today is, is both unpublished uh, data uh, and also uh, quite preliminary in some places. Um, but I think that's sort of the fun of these types of lecture series is to really uh, to tell people about what's going on now, not something that's already published. And so with that, um, now one of the godfathers, the early godfathers of retinal anatomy was Ramon Cajal. And Ramon Cajal was an incredible artist. And what he did is he documented through his drawings, the retinas of, of uh, numerous animals in the kingdom. And here in the center is uh, one of these drawings of the, of the retina with the photoreceptors at the top of the screen. Uh, you can see there's uh, multiple sets, multiple layers involving uh, some, some neurons sandwiched into the middle that are conveying information from the outer retina to the inner retina. You can see the ganglion cells at the bottom of your screen there is the axons of those ganglion cells that form the optic nerve. He also identified some of the support cells that are present in these tissues. You can see an astrocyte at the very bottom of your screen down here. And this is one of these Mueller glia cells that span the retina. Now, Romoni Cajal used the Golgi technique, which allowed him to label the dendrites of individual neurons. And so what this allowed him to do is really uh, un look under the surface of these structures to see uh, what the morphology of the different neurons. And of course, looking under the surface revealed a much greater diversity in the morphology of cell types that we could appreciate from the gross retinal structure. At this point, we know most of the neurons that are present in the eye. You can think about these as the retinal hardware. So this represents the, the neuronal types found in the retina of, of mouse. And at the top of your screen, uh, you can see three types of photoreceptors. Those are UV and green cones. And then the longest one there is a rod photoreceptor. So there's really only three types of photoreceptors um, in the mouse retina. And they have dichromatic vision. Uh, now, in the first layer of the retina, the horizontal cells provide uh, feedback to those photoreceptors. They come in two varieties. As we continue to march deeper into the retina, we see that there are roughly 12 types, subtypes of bipolar cells. And we know that each of these bipolar types relay slightly different information about the visual world from the outer retina to the inner retina. And it's at this layer you can already see a high degree of parallelization and diversification of the visual signals. Now those bipolar cells make synaptic contacts onto amacrine cells and ganglion cells in the inner parts of the retina. And you can see that the diversity of cell types at these later stages is even greater than it is in the outer retina. The ganglion cells ultimately transmit features of the visual world onto the brain through the optic nerve. And we know that each of these ganglion cell types and their associated circuitries are involved in extracting those particular features from the visual world. And one of the populations that has been most interesting to me throughout my career is this group of inner neurons called the amacrine cells. And they actually are the most morphologically diverse cell type in the mouse retina. And these, these neurons, these inner neurons also release a, a very large array of neurotransmitters and neuromodulators that include GABA, glycine, acetylcholine, dopamine, and glutamine. And while these amacrines are thought to be involved in complex processing, more than 70% of these cell types have never been studied functionally. Uh, and really the majority of the work till now has been focused on four subtypes. And I'll point those out. This is the A2 and the A17 amacrine cells. These are both involved in scotopic vision or night vision. And the other two cell types for which quite a bit has been has been uh, worked out is really these starburst amacrine cells, which are involved in direction selectivity, and also the VGLU3 amacrine cell, which is involved in separating out local motion from global motion. 
And of course, one of the things that has allowed us, that is allowing us to dig deeper into these unknown amacrine types is the genetic accessibility we get from the mouse retina. And of course, all the beautiful previous anatomical work. Now, when you're trying to study a new cell type, uh, it, you really have to throw the kitchen sink um, at, at, at it. And some of the techniques we've used are viral synaptic tracing, paired recordings, optogenetics, functional calcium imaging, neuropharmacology, serial electron microscopy, and computational modeling. And we use these different techniques to get at these questions. How are these amacrines wired up? What computation do they support? And what molecular and morphological specializations contribute to these computations? And for the majority, the first 15 years of my career, I've really been focused on these questions, uh, but some of the recent work has kicked us in a new direction and to ask another question, which is, do amacrine cells participate in neurovascular coupling pathways? And neurovascular coupling was a brand new topic for me. And so I'm gonna walk you through the vasculature of the mouse retina. And similar to other brain areas, the, the retina is highly vascular. Uh, it's supplied, uh, the blood is supplied by this vascular, uh, these vessels. Um, it supplies oxygen, glucose, and nutrient and removes waste. Uh, there are three major types of vessels, the arteries and arterioles, the capillaries and the veins. And I'll point out that the organization of these vessels is different in each individual's eye. And this unique organization of these vessels is what allows security uh, companies to use images of the retina as, as a biometric security uh, feature. Uh, now, it's also important to note that blood flow is modulated locally within neural tissues, and this is called hyperemia, where there's intense neural activity, and that intense neural activity uh, triggers for the local vessels to open up and allow more blood flow to the region. And this change in blood flow is actually so tightly connected to changes in neural activity that it's actually used as a proxy for neural activity in the bold fMRI imaging technique. So changes in the vascular are very tightly associated with changes in neural activity. And of course, if we wanna understand the interface between the retina and the blood, uh, and the blood, we need to look at what's commonly referred to as the blood-brain barrier. And this is the textbook description of a blood-brain barrier. So you're here on the right side of your screen. Endothelial cells make up the vessel walls and they're held together by tight junctions. Now surrounding these vessels are parasites, which are contractile cells, and they're doing most of the mechanical work for opening and closing the vessels. And surrounding the vessels and the, and the parasites are astrocytes, which are these glial support cells. And it's been shown that the astrocytes are really communicating with the parasites to control the the vessel diameter. And of course, there's also a few cracks in between the astrocytes where neurons actually have direct access to the blood. Now this blood brain barrier definitely controls what comes in and out of the retina or the blood. And this also uh, limits the, our ability to, to um, provide pharmaceutical uh, manipulations uh, for, for diseases in particular brain regions. So this is a really important feature um, at the interface between blood and, and brain. And we wanted to look at this in the mouse retina. Okay, so on the left-hand side of the screen, you're actually looking on face at the mouse retina. These are the photoreceptors in the outer retina, all these little dots. And I've labeled the blood vessels with the sulfurotomy 101, and that's gonna show up here in red. So this is just a Z stack on the, on the left. We're, we're focusing up through the retina. You can see the blood vessels and, and small red blood cells that are present inside those vessels. And the main point here is that the, the mouse retina, just like the human retina, is a, a trivascular network that consists of deep, intermediate, and superficial layers. And the superficial layer here corresponds to the ganglion cell layer. And again, these are where the, the nerve fibers that make up your optic nerve are located. 
And if we take this vasculature, the Z stack that we just collected, this volumetric uh, stack, and we could collapse that in, in one, um, one axis, you can see this full Z projection up here. It really looks like a tangled mess. But if we instead then break uh, the layers apart, we can see that the vessels in each layer very nicely fill out the retinal, retinal space and look quite a bit like little roadways with cul-de-sacs and, and traffic circles. Um, now the retina, as with the brain, of course, it's using the oxygen that's being supplied. And from some beautiful work by you et al in 1994, they used one of these oxygen tension probes, which they inserted into the rat retina and slowly advanced this probe through the retinal layers while measuring oxygen tension of the tissue. Now, oxygen, oxygen tension really reflects a balance between oxygen consumption at that layer of the tissue and also supply of oxygen from the blood source. And so the, some of the numbers from the study are, are um, superimposed on top of the retina here. So the top layer, these are the ganglion cell again with the superficial blood vessels, uh, the inner retina with these intermediate capillary levels, and the deep layers of the capillaries, okay? And what you see is that the retina, the, the, the oxygen com consumption in the middle of the retina is highest. And this means that uh, this, this part of the retina is also highly subject uh, to some sort of ischemic damage that would re reduce oxygen flow to the tissue. And it's been shown that when oxygen is, is occluded from the central retinoid, the retinal artery, uh, that you get this dramatic uh, reduction in oxygen in the intermediate and the superficial layers in the retina. Now, with the, on the time scale of minutes, this eliminates the, the retinal response uh, as seen through electroretinograms. And if the oxygen is, is reperfused through the tissue or the blood is reperfused the tissue, the light responses come back. However, if the retina experiences oxygen deprivation for a longer period of time, the neurons begin to die and can no longer transmit information from the retina onto the brain. Here is some, uh, so the retina also exhibits hyperemia and that is changes in blood flow in, in response to changes in neural activity. And I'm showing you the superficial blood vessels uh, from a paper, a beautiful paper by Cornfield and Newman, Eric Newman is a research professor up at the University of Minnesota, has done just a tremendous amount of beautiful work on renal hyperemia. Uh, these are the blood vessel layers, uh, uh, different blood vessels in the, in the superficial layers. So we have an arterial, first order arterial, which branches out into a second order arterial, which branches again into a third order arterial. Here in black are capillaries. You can see these thin vessels are studded with these green parasites. That's a particular feature of the capillaries. And at the bottom of the screen here is a vein that's carrying blood back, uh, back, back towards the heart and out of the retina. And what Cornfield showed here is that when they delivered a three hertz flickering light to the retina for 15 seconds, uh, they see an increase in the diameter of all major vessel types at the superficial layer. And uh, in hyperemia, this same effect is really a very local effect, as I'm going to show you here. So here I've used sulforotamine 101 to label the blood vessels. In gray, you're looking at the, uh, at the ganglion cells on the retinal surface. So this is the superficial layer. In the top left-hand point of the screen is where the blood is actually flowing into this fork in the road and is splitting to go towards the right of your screen or towards the bottom of your screen. And what I'm doing here is just using, again, a three hertz flicker, 150 micron spot of light that's centered on this yellow circle on one of the two branches. And at this other branch, uh, there is no visual stimulation. And the point here is to show you that this hyperemia is a very local effect, okay? So it's changing in response, the blood flow is changing in response to local activity. And so let's get rid of the, uh, the, the retinal visualization. Now we can look at just the blood vessels here and we can quantify the diameter uh, at any location within these vessels. And, and we can make measurements. This guy here is around 
seven microns wide. This guy here is just over 10 microns. And we can now deliver the visual stimuli and you can watch the vessels change uh, in diameter. In particular, you'll see in the, in the yellow section here, you'll see this vessel expand by 35%, but a neighboring leg coming from the same arterial is, is relatively unmodulated. So this hyperemia is a very local effect. In Cornfield and Newman, uh, they also look more carefully at, at the different layers within the retina itself. And they found that when they compare changes in capillary diameter at the superficial and deep layers to the intermediate layer, we see the strongest modulation. And I'll remind you that this is, the, this is also the part of the retina which experiences the lowest oxygen. And so modulation of these vegetables are gonna be particularly important um, for providing nutrients and oxygen to those inner retinal layers in an activity dependent manner. So the retinal inter or the blood brain interface that I showed you earlier uh, is typically thought to be encased in astrocytes. And as Hall shows here, the astrocytes are present in the retina but they're really restricted to the ganglion cell layer. And these are actually the astrocytes contacting vessels in the ganglion cell layer uh, in the mouse. Okay, so you can see these beautiful astrocytes, but what about the other two uh, layers of vessels, the intermediate and deep layers? There's no astrocytes there. And so we really have turned our attention to these Mueller glia cells, which span the length of the retina and have the ability to come in contact with all three layers of the vascular network. Now, Cajal um, beautifully drew out the morphology of Mueller glia in many different species. And a few of those are shown at the bottom of the screen. Frog, carp, lizard, chicken, and cow. And while these Mueller cells have many functions and are present in avascular retina, uh, I'm gonna talk a little about, about their potential role in modulating uh, and controlling neurovascular coupling in both mouse and potentially in humans. So the, here is a Mueller glia that I've injected with a, with a green fluorophore, Alexa 48, and we've just reconstructed one of these Mueller glia. You can appreciate its long uh, morphology that it spans the entire retina. There's a very complex morphology uh, again, we're labeling the blood vessels also here in yellow with the sulfur rhodamine 101. So you can see it spans the trilaminar network. If we just look more carefully at the contact between the Mueller cells and the blood vessels, here in the bottom right-hand corner, we're looking at uh, the Mueller Enfi wrapping the capillaries and the ganglion cell layer. And we can see that as we go into the intermediate and deep layers, even though this Mueller cell is is not exactly directly adjacent to one of these vessels. It reaches out fine processes to make contact to each one of the vessels that is nearby. And so this, again, is consistent with the idea that these Mueller cells uh, might be communicating with these blood vessels. Now, Mueller cells have many textbook functions in the retina, and many of these are true for other brain regions as well. They're involved in glycogen break breakdown to help fuel, fuel aerobic metabolism for neurons. Uh, they mop up neural waste from the extracellular space. They protect neurons from excitotoxicity when too much excitatory neurotransmitter is released. Uh, they control ionic homeostasis. In particular, uh, they regulate potassium concentrations near the end feet and the ganglion cell layer. Uh, they contribute to the, re the generation of the electroretinogram, in particular the B wave, and they synthesize retinic acid from retinol. And lastly, it's even been shown that these, these long, thin Mueller cells can act as light guides and reduce optical scatter as light is transmitted from the inner parts of the retina to the outer parts of the retina, where they interact with the photoreceptors. But Eric Newman has shown, of course, another, uh, another function for these Mueller cells. And he finds that when he looks very carefully at, at Mueller cells and the calcium signals in these Mueller cells, and especially when they make contact with vessels at the intermediate layer, that activity in the Mueller cell is correlated with activity in the vessel diameters, okay? 
So you can see here, he's expressing a genetically coded calcium sensor in the Mueller cells in green. And he's imaging the blood vessels, which he's labeled again with the sulfur rhodamine. He sees these changes in calcium signal in the Mueller cells, which correlates with the increase in vessel diameter. Okay. And he's also shown that uh, this happens in vivo and that it's largely dependent on intracellular calcium stores within the Mueller cells themselves. Eric has also shown that these uh, Mueller cells are interacting with the vessels through the arachnidonic acid metabolite pathways. And I won't really be talking about those further today, but I will be digging more into these Mueller cells. So if a Mueller cell is involved in hyperemia, not only should it be in a position to control vessel diameter, should, but it should also be in a position to sense neural activity. And here, Eric has labeled uh, Mueller cells with a calcium sensitive dye. And you can see uh, spontaneous activity that happens uh, throughout these optical recordings. He then delivers a flickering light to the retina where he sees an increase in some of these calcium sparks within the Mueller cells. And if we look at the average here, we can see that these Mueller's are responding quite nicely with increases in calcium in response to visual stimulation. And, and from a mechanistic standpoint, Eric showed that the majority of these light evoked calcium signals were blocked by an ATP receptor antagonist, suramin. So this really indicates that the Mueller cells are sensing the release of ATP from neurons and that the release of ATP is driving calcium signals in the Mueller's, which is playing a role in controlling vessel diameter at the intermediate capillary layer. Now, since, since the time of Ramon e. Cajal, our anatomical approaches have gotten a little better as well. And one of the approaches that we'll be talking about today is serial block face electron microscopy. Now, electron microscopy is an old approach to studying neural circuitry, uh, and it provides very high resolution images with nanometer resolution. And the advancement in this technique came uh, when people uh, uh, just learned that they can in fact fix tissue within one of these resin blocks. They could image, get the ultra structure from the surface of this block, and then they could go in and shave off, make a very thin shave off the top of that block and re-image the surface. And this process occurs over and over and over for several weeks, which allows you to collect ultra-structural data from a small block of retina. And uh, one of the most important papers, at least in the retina, uh, where this was originally shown was from this Helmstetter et al. Uh, paper. And this really allowed them to look in a much more unbiased manner at all the cell types that are present in the retina. And in this case, we decided we wanted to use this technique to learn more about the fine detail of connections between the Mueller cells and the blood vessels and the Mueller cells and the neurons. And the work that I'm going to show you has all been done by Adit Sabnes, who's a very talented post back in the lab. Uh, I'll also say he's applying for graduate school this year. And so if you're on admission committees, I highly encourage you to give his application a look. He's a very talented guy and a lot of fun to work with. And so at it, uh, really developed an eye for these Mueller cells and began reconstructing their complex morphology at the ultrastructural layer level. Here are some blood vessels that have been skeletonized in red. This is the intermediate capillary layer. The bottom of your screen is the deep layer. And these are three examples of Mueller cells re reconstructed all the fine processes uh, in the middle of the retina. And he's, as I mentioned, we focused on two aspects. One of those aspects being the relationship between the Mueller's and the blood vessels. And I should point out, if we look here, where these Mueller cells uh, come in close contact with these blood vessels, that they reach out and form these little hands that seem to surround these vessels here, okay? And these vessels are not drawn to scale, they actually fill out the space. And you can see that more clearly here with an on-face image of the vessel here in red, this is the capillary vessel in red. This is one of these electron micrographs. So again, it's just the dark areas or electron dense uh, areas. 
And um, he can identify the vessel, he can identify the parasite here in light blue, and he can also identify the Mueller processes. And he can trace those out and color code those. Um, and here is the, the, the 3D reconstruction of the vessel. You can see that the Mueller cells form a, a, a really a, a nearly complete ensheathment of the vessels. And we were really struck by this feature. And you can see if you remove the vessel, uh, these sheaths form uh, long stretches um, that appear very tunnel-like in nature. Now, at it, what he did, I thought this was really cool, but he color-coded processes from um, different Mueller cells or different Mueller processes, different colors. And so this kind of gives you a greater appreciation that the sheath is actually made up of little tiny processes from many different Mueller cells. So these Mueller cells really combine to form this continuous sheath. And it's of course possible that this sheath-like structure um, is artifactual, um, but as we look over larger and larger volumes, again, we see that the sheath forms uh, a, a very uh, intense coverage of the vessel. In fact, it's a 98% coverage. Uh, and this was even higher than we were expecting. Very, very interesting and, and, and nearly complete. And these Mueller cells are really on top of these uh, uh, electrically coupled parasites here and really seem to be almost shielding them from other things that are happening in the retina. As I mentioned, it's possible that these sheets are artifactual in some way. And we know that this electron microscopy technique uh, leads to a collapse of the extracellular space. So membranes between neurons and membranes between uh, glia cells will all be uh, touching one another uh, when, when, when fixed in this sort of the classical electron microscopy manner. Uh, but so we decided to also look in a, in a block created by Kevin Brigman, where they were able to maintain the sort of the natural occurring extracellular space in, in healthy tissue. And you can see in these electron graphs now, there's spaces between the neurons and the various processes in the tissue. We can see these Mueller cells here in purple and the, and the capillaries here in red. And when Adit reconstructs larger volumes of these, he sees that the Mueller sheets are still quite continuous and that the cracks uh, between the individual processes are very minimal. And this includes contact between processes uh, of, of different um, Mueller cells. So this really indicates that there are probably some proteins, possibly uh, gap junctions that are holding these, these sheaths together and, 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 and in particular, uh, different, uh, different pieces from different Mueller cells. And this is something we want to look at more carefully with Jackie Meinhardt at the University of Maryland. The vessels that I've shown you so far uh, really come from this intermediate layer, and that's where we know the Mueller cells are the or the primate, primary glial cell. Uh, but we also wanted to look at these connectors, uh, which, which, um, uh, the, which, which span the interplexiform layer and connect the vessels in the superficial and the intermediate. We thought, well, if neural signals are activating uh, blood vessels, this is a great site of interaction. But what had it found when he looked very carefully at the Mueller cells, um, surrounding these, these little connector vessels, he finds a near complete ensheathment, suggesting that they, they might even be uh, even that much more insulated uh, from neural activity in the inner retina. So we then wanted to look at activity in these neural sheaths. And to do that, we're gonna use this, this calcium loading method that was originally shown by Eric Newman in the, in the late 1990s. Uh, but the short of it here, this is the mouse retina on the left-hand side of your screen. We're again labeling the, the blood vessels here in red with sulfur uh, And what Eric really showed is you can use these, uh, these AM calcium dyes, which you can wash on the retina for 30 minutes, and it'll be taken up by the astrocytes and the glial cell envy, which you wind up seeing really as negatives here in the ganglion cell layer. We've also included DAPI, which is a nuclear stain. So that's labeling all the ganglion cells and the amacrine cells of this layer. And as I can say, you can see that, that, the, that these are really a mutually exclusive label between the ganglion cells and the calcium dyes. And this really just shows that the, 
the calcium dyes are not loading into the ganglion cells, but are instead preferentially loaded into the glia. And this is a really cool technique, and we can activate these glia networks several different ways. Uh, one of the ways is just to simply puff ATP onto the very surface of the retina, and I'm showing that here. Uh, this elicits, elicits calcium waves in the ganglion cell layer, um, which spread out uh, across the vessels and along the surface. If we look deeper into the retina, we can see a very clear labeling of these Mueller stalks. These uh, images on the right come from the middle of the inner plexiform layer. So this approach is really doing a great job of low to la labeling Mueller glia cells and allowing us to image their activity while also monitoring blood vessels. Um, again, other ways that we can elicit these calcium signals in Mueller cells, one of these happens to be physical injury to the retina. So we're literally just poking the retina at the beginning of this video in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. That's eliciting a calcium wave that's propagating out from the site of interaction. And we can see when these calcium waves shown in green uh, reach one of these vessels, it causes uh, uh, an increase in the vessel diameter. And so in changes in calcium in these networks uh, can propagate and they can cause increases in vessel diameter. And uh, uh, most of the talk has been focused on natural uh, methods for activating uh, glial networks and vessels. And so here are actually uh, light evoked calcium signals observed uh, at the intermediate capillary level. And we can see when we deliver, again, one of these three hertz flickering stimuli, and that, that spot of light is denoted by the dotted yellow line. Uh, it activates calcium signals in this glia network, which uh, spread out. When those calcium signals reach a vessel, it causes an increase in the vessel diameter. And if we look at other portions of the vessel where calcium uh, waves do not uh, elicit a response, we also see a lack of a change in the, in the capillary uh, vessel. And so, you know, this is really just to show you we have a, a very powerful technique where we can image calcium signal in these networks and we can activate Mueller cell activity in several different ways. Now, I wanna take you, of course, back to our sheath observations. Uh, we wanted to see if these, these sheaths are functional. Uh, our our um, block face volume also only included vessels in the intermediate la level and not at the deeper layers. So this, uh, this functional imaging probe gave an opportunity to look at vessels and other layers and different types of vessels as well. And here, I'm just puffing ATB on the surface while carefully looking at the areas surrounding these vessels. Uh, we're looking at intermediate level vessels on the left. You can see the Mueller cells are activated in green. They form these beautiful sheaths to surround those vessels. Here is one of the connectors in the middle of the IPL. You can see when it's activated, you see these beautiful rings. And we can look at the deepest layers, which actually contain arterioles and capillaries. And we see beautiful Mueller cell activation along with strong sheath-like activity along all major vessel types. And so now we have a method for looking at, at uh, Mueller sheaths under natural uh, uh, sort of healthy conditions. And we're starting to think about disease models where this might actually change. And one of the first models we're looking at with some help from one of our graduate students, Jai Li, uh, is a mouse model of retinal degeneration. Now, in retinal degeneration, the photoreceptors begin to um, die first. And as the photoreceptors begin to die, the retina begins to change. And one of the big features, the commonly known features, is this gliosis, or these change in these Mueller cell morphology. And sure enough, as the photoreceptors die, these Mueller cells change from this nice, uh, clean columnar uh, organization they, they swell and they extend processes in, in different directions. And as the disease progresses, these glial cells really take over large parts of the tissue. And, and this happens as, as synapses and other features are really beginning to degrade within the disease. And so uh, this is just some preliminary data from an RD10. This is a mouse model of retinal degeneration with um, a slightly prolonged 
um, uh, degeneration cycle. Here I'm looking at P31 or postnatal day 31. So these tissue or, or these, um, these mice still have some visual function. So they're really a late stage one. And so we wanted to see what do the Mueller cells and the achievements really look like under these conditions? Well, it turns out that the ensheathment of the, the capillaries at the intermediate level and also the inner retina look largely like they do in the healthy animal. But when we go to the outer retina where we know the photoreceptors are dying off, we see something quite different, okay? So we see sort of this blobby calcium activation and we don't really see the clean sheaths that we store under, saw under normal healthy conditions. And just to remind you on the left here, is our, our calcium transients in the deep layer of a healthy mouse. On the right is calcium signals in the deep layer of this RD10. So we can see that the sheaths, although they seem to be uh, largely intact in the inner retina, are really uh, falling apart and seem to be abandoning the vessels of the deepest layer. And of course, this is just one time point throughout the degeneration cycle. And we wanna span this out to look at more ages uh, to see at what point uh, sheets in the, in the intermediate layer uh, uh, begin to break apart if in fact they do. And so my part one conclusions, uh, I've shown you that Mueller wrap capillaries and arterioles throughout the retina, uh, that they really combine to form continual ensheathment of capillaries. And this uh, ranks somewhere around 98% coverage and that these Mueller cells may contribute to the retina's blood-brain barrier at the intermediate and deep vessel layers. Um, I've also shown you some data from us and from other groups that uh, Mueller glia participate in hyperemia at the capillary level. And I've also shown you some preliminary data that these ensheathments are disrupted in the RD10 model. Now, as far as future directions, we wanna look at other disease. We know that, for exa example, in retinal diet, uh, retinal di di sorry, <laughs> diabetic retinopathy, uh, that increases in blood glucose levels leads to downregulation of gap junctions between Mueller cells and gap junctions between parasites. And so we want to see how that affects these uh, vessel sheaths. We're also working with some scientists at the University of Wisconsin to collect a uh, serial block face. Um, um, uh, a serial block face microscopy data from the primate retina. And this will allow us to see if in fact these Mueller sheaths are present in, a, in primates and humans as well. And lastly, Added is looking at the, the cracks in these sheaths. We see, uh, you know, it's not 100% coverage of all the vessels. And we wanna see what, what's really present in those cracks. Are they neurons? Are they neurons of a specific type? Um, are those neurons interacting directly with the parasites of blood vessels, or are they simply acquiring nutrients from the vessels themselves? So I'd like to move on to the second part of my talk, uh, which talks about the potential role for amacrine cells in neurovascular coupling in the retina. As I stated, this is a very diverse cell population, and they use a broad array of neurotransmitters some excitatory, some inhibitory, uh, and they also use extensive uh, uh, gap junction networks to communicate with other neurons. But one of the interesting findings early on from retinal work was that when, when we used antibodies against machinery involved in GABAergic or glycinergic transmission, these are both inhibitory neurotransmitters, that these antibodies labeled amacrines in a mutually exclusive fashion so that amacrines were labeled either for GABA or for glycine, but not both. They also noted in these studies that roughly 15% of amacrine cells didn't seem to express GABA or glycine. And these cells have been named non-GABAergic, non-glycinergic amacrine cells. And interestingly, a, a very similar percentage of amacrine cells also do not express these markers in the primate. And so this suggests that uh, a similar percentage of primate amacrine cells also uh, have some neurotransmitters that we, we know virtually nothing about, okay? And one of the amacrines which we have studied in, in extensive detail is this starburst amacrine cell. And this is a GABAergic interneuron. 
And some recent work by Bortier Sagdaleev in New York has really implicated these starburst amacrine cells in, in neurovascular coupling. And so on the left-hand side of your screen is one of those starburst amacrine cells. Uh, they were named based on their beautiful symmetric morphology. Those starburst amacrine cells release GABA and acetylcholine onto the direction-selected ganglion cells. And it's these actions that are involved in the, in the encoding of directed motion. But what these guys found is whenever they activate starburst amacrine cells, uh, in this case, in this panel C here, by expressing light activated channels or channel adoption in the starburst cells, they could see a relaxation of arterioles and capillaries uh, in the retina. So when they activate these starburst amacrine cells, and I'll call these SACs for short, uh, they saw an increase in arterial diameter and an increase in capillary diameter. And when they just bath applied uh, an acetylcholine receptor antagonist, sorry, uh, they also saw a similar effect, a relaxation of vessels, uh, both arterials and capillaries. So this really suggested that a single population of amacrine cells could be involved in neurovascular coupling. And they hypothesized that the sacs are releasing acetylcholine, which is in acting directly on the parasites or on the endothelial cells. And it has been shown that these two cell types do express um, acetylcholine receptors. However, um, this, our work from the first half of the talk and some previous work from the same lab has really shown that, that Mueller cells seem to insheat these vessels even as they traverse the inner plexiform layer. And here on the right-hand side is data from this Ivanova 2014 paper where they labeled the starburst cell in green, the blood vessels here in red, and they've also labeled Mueller cells here in white. So you can say that the Mueller cell actually creates these fine uh, sheaths or processes it really seemed to separate the starburst amacrine cells from the vessels itself. So it's quite possible that these that acetylcholine is not acting directly on the blood vessel walls of the parasite, but is instead interacting through Mueller cells and, and um, treating them as an intermediate in this pathway. Well, this led me to, uh, to look for sac of oak calcium signals in, in Mueller cells. So again, I'm using the same uh, flow for uh, glial loading protocol that Eric Newman um, uh, developed in the late 90s. And you can see all these Mueller cell stalks here in yellow in the middle of the inner plexiform layer. And now I brought an electrode in the retina and made a whole cell patch or clamp reporting from only a single sac here. And the other thing I wanna mention is these sacs are in very high density. So anywhere we look within the retinal tissue, uh, there are dendrites from roughly 70 overlapping sacs uh, that are covering that area. So while I'm recording from only one sac, there are many sacs covering every inch of the retinal surface. Okay, so we decided just to just to cause activity in a single sac to see if we could evoke calcium signals in the Mueller glia, and that's what I'm showing you here. Uh, this top trace here, this is the voltage command that we're delivering through the patch electrode to this. Uh, starburst amacrine cell here in purple. And then we're monitoring calcium in all these different Mueller stalks, uh, some of which I pointed out with the yellow circles here, or the white circles here. Um, these are the individual delta F over F responses of the change in calcium signal coming from each one of those spots. And below here is the average response at all these spots. So we can see that when we activate a starburst amacrine cell, that we are able to activate uh, these Mueller's and that the Mueller's seem to be in general integrating this calcium signal over the duration of the SAC stimulation. And so this is, uh, this is really uh, up to the date on where we are on this project. But of course, the next stop is to use neuropharmacology to separate out these possible pathways. So the, the updated uh, um, uh, model that I'm showing here is that these SACs or these starburst amacrine cells are actually co-releasing acetylcholine and ATP. And it's been shown that ATP is co-released at cholinergic synapses. 
I also showed you earlier that ATB is a very effective activator of Mueller glia. And so that one or both of these neurotransmitters could be activating Mueller cells, which is then changing uh, their processing of these arachnidonic acid uh, pathways, uh, which is altering the parasites and causing a dilation of the capillaries. And these pathways are indeed modulated by uh, nitric oxide. So this is another level of modulation on top of these pathways. And Eric Newman has shown that when nitric oxide is high, that uh, all of the vessels in response to the light uh, uh, exhibit uh, constrictions. And that when nitric oxide levels are very low, that all the vessels uh, exhibit um, dilation. So nitric oxide seems to shift the balance of these pathways from dilation and, and constricting. But what we really believe again is that the amacrine cells are working through the Mueller's as an intermediate. And ultimately the neuropharmacology is gonna help us um, pick apart these two pathways. So what about other amacrine cells? Well, uh, as I said, 70% of the amacrine cells uh, we know virtually nothing about their function. And in an attempt to dig deeper into this unknown set, we use the uh, serial block phase data sets and, and just simply rank the amacrine cells found in that data set by density. So how many cell bodies for a particular amacrine cell type uh, is found within a given area of retinal space? And when we sort those amacrine cells by their density, we can see the largest density is of the A2 amacrine cell, and, the, and, and within this top 10 are also the starburst amacrine cells. And the MAC, and I'll tell you a little more about why we are calling this amacrine cell the MAC, is the second most densely expressed amacrine cell in the mouse retina. And this is the morphology of these cells found in this block face data set. Now, we know really nothing about the neurotransmitters that this cell expresses. And some data I'm gonna show you actually puts it into this NGNG category. Um, but luckily due to the unique morphology of this cell, we were able to scour the GenSet bank, which has a, a whole array of transgenic mouse lines. And we were able to find a particular line that seemed to label an amacrine cell with morphology that looks similar to this MAC. And sure enough, this, uh, this mouse line does fluorescently label the MAC. Here is one of these MACs shown here. This is a DAC2 GFP line. Um, you can see it has this, uh, this uh, uh, single process that comes down into the inner plexiform layer with this bushy arbor. Um, and even though we are, we are studying this cell in mouse, there is a, a very similar uh, amacrine cell found in the primate retina. And this is observed from some of the earliest work in, uh, in the early 40s. So this amacrine cell does seem to be present in both mouse and primate. We know virtually nothing about it. Uh, we did use some of these classic antibody labeling for mechanisms involved in inhibitory transmitters, uh, GABA and glycine. And we find that it doesn't seem to label for either of these, uh, uh, either of these markers, which really does put it in this mystery category of non-gabaergic, non-glycinergic. And in, this, in, our, in our work, we go on to look at more detail of what neurotransmitter these cells are actually using. But I wanna point your attention to another finding from this work, and that is when Adit very carefully looked at, these, at the ultra structure of these MACs and their association with the Mueller cells, and this is one of these Mueller cells in red, and these are the dendrites of a MAC here in teal, what they found was that these Mueller cells really wrap the MAC processes. And in some cases, they even form complete ensheathments, okay? And here is just one of these MACs, and you can see that it has a total of six ensheathments. Uh, and these ensheathments are coming from two different Mueller cells. Four of the ensheathments are coming from one Mueller cell in red, and two of the ensheathments are coming from another Mueller cell in yellow. And this seems to be a, a feature that's fairly specific to the MAC. Now, of course, we want to look at how the MAC talks to these Mueller cells. And our first approach was just to simply in, inject small tracer molecules into one of these MACs. 
and to look at the diffusion of these molecules into any coupled cells. And this is one of the classic approaches for, to look for gap junction between pairs of neurons or pairs of glial cells. And what, what we found here is when we injected one of these MACs with neurobiotin in this case, that neurobiotin we found diffused into approximately two neighboring Mueller glia cells. And this is indicative of direct coupling between the two cell types. We also included another molecule, Lucifer yellow, which does not pass readily through gap junctions. And this tracer molecule was really restricted to the MAC itself. So again, this really supported the notion that there is direct coupling between the, the amacrine cell and the Mueller glia. And this is what led us to name the, this cell the Mueller glia coupled amacrine. From these tracer coupling experiments, we found Mueller cell labeling in all 14 of our injections and a, and a median of two Mueller cells per injected MAC, which is completely consistent with our electron microscopy reconstructions. We found some inconsistent labeling of ant wide field amacrine cells, uh, but this is something we did not explore further. But if you'd like to learn more about this new amacrine cell, including information about mouse lines that allow targeting of these cells, uh, along with some antibodies that label these cells, I'd encourage you to look at this paper we published earlier this year in the Journal of Neuroscience. And so from the second part of the talk, I'd just like to conclude. Um, I've been talking about amacrine cells and their potential role in neurovascular coupling. I started by telling you about the SAC, the starburst amacrine cell, and evidence that can, it can actually drive vasodilation of capillaries. Uh, I've also shown you some preliminary data that SACs do elicit calcium signals in Mueller glia stocks in the interplexiform layer. And at the moment, it's currently unclear if the SACs act directly on the blood vessels and parasites or if the Mueller glia are acting as an intermediate. And that's one of the key questions that we're gonna be focused on moving forward. I've also told you a little bit about a newly discovered amacrine cell, the MAC, which seems to be heavily ensheathed by Mueller glia. And this is an unusual feature. And in fact, neuron glia coupling has, to my knowledge, never been described in the retina, in the in mammalian retina before now. And I've also shown you that there's dye coupling between these MACs and Mueller cells that suggests that these two cell types are actually electrically coupled. And in the future direction, we wanna ask if these, these SACs are really um, using, as I said, the Mueller cells as an intermediate, and does the activation of these Mueller cells depend on acetylcholine or ATP or both? Um, we're also looking at the possibility that MAX activate Mueller cells at these, at these local ensheathments or vice versa. And, and do these MAX actually participate in the hyperemia function? And we'd also like to look at what nitric oxide sources are modulating the dilation constriction balance. And we know that there are at least three sources of nitric oxide in the retina, neuronal nitric oxide, uh, inducible nitric oxide, and, um, uh, and, and endothelial nitric oxide. And so we really wanna see which of these sources, if not multiple of those sources are con uh, contributing to regulate this these functions. And I'll also highlight that there is an amacrine cell that uh, indeed releases nitric oxide. So it may be another amacrine cell that's involved in this process. Um, and in final conclusions, uh, we've really, I've really found that the retina is this beautiful compact system for studying neurovascular coupling and hyperemia. Uh, and, and it really represents a mini brain in my, in my mind. It allows us a much more compact system to study more complex phenomena. Uh, the evidence that we show suggests amyloglia and parasites, both part of the retinal blood interface, contribute to dilation and constriction of vessels. That Mueller ensheathment is near complete and is altered in disease. And the amacrine cells likely play a role in hyperemia and use Mueller glia as an intermediate. And with that, I'd just like to say thank you to those involved in the work. Uh, I've shown data from the individuals here in red. Um, and we also have a long list of collaborators that have contributed to these projects. 
Um, and I'd also like to, to point out uh, Manalini Hoon, Manalini Hoon and Ronak Sinha at the University of Washington that are working with us uh, to acquire this serial block face data from the primate retina. And I thank you for your attention. Okay, Will, uh, thank you very much. Really nice talk, really impressive, the amount of data and, and new findings. So <laughs> as a host, I would like to ask uh, a very, you know, uh, for me, a, 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 a a question that relates a bit with my field that is uh, circadian rhythms. I would like to ask if, 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 if you know if these interactions between amacrine cells and Mueller cells are modulated by circadian mechanisms or what do you think uh, at the... The short answer is, I mean, this is a great question, Jose, and it's not something we've looked at yet. Uh, we, we definitely do think that circadian rhythms could play a role in the coupling and the hyperemia response, but we don't have any data to show that. We certainly find that at the, at, uh, as we've begun looking at some of the cracks of the vessels at the intermediate layer, we do see some M1 uh, retinal ganglion cells. So there do seem to be some melanopsin containing ganglion cells which are involved in some circadian uh, rhythm behaviors that seem to be present at these cracks. So it's possible that they you know, uh, could be signaling information directly to the blood, but they could also be picking up circadian cues from the blood. Um, and in particular, uh, you know, dopamine, nitric oxide, other things could certainly yes. be playing a role uh, in these enchantments. Great question. Okay. So I'll go to the live chat. So could, could I ask if, if you could stop to, to share your screen so we can? Okay. All right, thank you very much. So from the, from the audience, um, uh, from Professor Marla Feller, uh, she asked if do all the lateral processes that you show uh, in the first part of your talk go to the basals, and if a subset of lateral processes are, 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 are if a subset of lateral processes, anything else distinct about them? Sorry, I didn't catch the last part about that. So I, I will repeat the question. So if Mar, Prof. Marla Feller asks, if do all the lateral processes go to the vessels? That's the first part uh, of the question. And uh, then... Mm -hmm. If a subset of lateral processes, anything else distinct about them? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, as Ad has showed, and, and Marla has shown as well, there are a ton of fine processes that extend from the Mueller cells within the inner plexiform layer. And when there's a vessel nearby, these processes do seem to reach out and make contact with the vessels. So if there's a vessel nearby, it's likely to reach out and grab it but many of these processes are not making contact with vessel. And, and instead, uh, these guys seem to be surrounding synapses and also ensheathing some of the amacrine cells. Uh, one of the example I showed today is really the MAC. So, you know, the Mueller's are, you know, creating substantial interactions with neurons in the inner plexiform layer and substantial interactions with the vessels whenever one is sort of nearby or available. Okay. Thanks, Marla. Uh, so uh, in the same way, uh, continuing with that question, uh, Marla also asked if do other lateral processes localized to synapses or some other not neural structures? Yeah, and, and that's kind of what I was showing in the latter part of the talk that, that some of these processes just completely wrap this MAC cell, for example. And when we first looked at the electron microscopy, we expected to see synapses, you know, but, uh, groups of vesicles, maybe electron dense membrane regions that would be indicative of chemical synapses. But much to our surprise, we did not find chemical synapses at these points of contacts between the MAC and the Mueller cells. And so at first they were a real mystery 
when we started in trace, uh, injecting the tracer molecules, that's when we began to get some evidence uh, for direct coupling between the two cell types. And we think that that is probably happening at the ensheathments, but we, our data sets don't have sufficient resolution to resolve the gap junctions themselves. So, um, you know, in short, some of those processes are definitely associated with neurons. In some cases, they're, uh, you know, completely wrapping those neurons, but there aren't always clear chemical synapses at these sites of interaction. Okay, so um, from David Berson. Uh, hey, Will, beautiful work. Regarding the SAC influence on basals, do Miller cell express cholinergic receptors? Ah, yeah. So this is a, this is a great question. And Marla has published some work on this recently that shows in development, uh, Mueller cells definitely express uh, cholinergic receptors. Although it would appear from their data and others that these cholinergic receptors are really down-regulated in adults. So it doesn't mean that the, that the cholinergic receptors are entirely gone, uh, but they aren't necessarily expressed at as high a levels as they are during development. So, uh, you know, there's evidence that those mechanisms are probably there, um, but ultimately we are going to test this signaling pathway directly and, and really try to get to the bottom of this question. Is it pure energic activation of Mueller cells, cholinergic activation of Mueller cells, or is there really a direct interaction with the parasites in the vessels? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go to the chat if there is any other question. Um, uh, so from Evelyn Cernagor, any idea what's happened during neonatal cholinergic waves? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, again, this is something that Marla Feller uh, can speak to much more directly than I, than I can. Certainly those uh, retinal waves are activating the Mueller cells uh, quite strongly. Um, so I, I imagine they are playing you know, some roles in the in, in the development of the, the circuits and maybe the establishment of the vasculature. Uh, that's something that, that we really haven't begun to think about yet. So I really don't have any data uh, to talk about today, but I really would point you to some of uh, Marlo Feller's work, recent work on the topic. Okay. Yeah, we've clearly been too focused on uh, neuronal development. And I think you're right. This is gonna be a really rich area to look at vascular development. So thanks for all the plugs, Will. So. <laughs> okay. So I think I, we got one more question from the chat. So Maria Cosan, uh, amazing talk and beautiful work. I noticed that the basal diameters appeared much smaller in the RD10 disease model compared to the healthy retina. Is this related to neurodegeneration in the retina? It's a great question. Um, you know, it, it, it's, uh, I haven't extensively looked uh, through the different vessels at the outer retina. You know, this is just a, a couple days of preliminary data. Uh, it's exactly the type of thing that we can quantify with this approach. Um, you know, in that deep layer, there are arterioles and capillaries, whereas the intermediate levels, there's really just capillaries. Um, but in the disease, certainly those sheaths seem to be largely breaking apart in that outer retina. And some of the vessels we're finding are, are indeed smaller. This will be a great opportunity to look if, you know, when hyperemia really begins to sort of die out in these degenerating models. We can see when these sheaths uh, begin to sort of break apart at what ages. And of course, you know, there may, we may be able to find some way to uh, intervene with the, the degradation of these of these um, achievements and, and changes in the vasculature. We certainly know that in disease, there are a lot of associated changes with vasculature. So it's quite possible that those vessels are, are different up there than they are under uh, uh, normal healthy conditions. 
That's a good question. Okay. I, I just want to say that this, as I, as I, this is really all a new direction for me. So I really appreciate everybody's questions and feedback, and and um, this is really helping to to fuel some of our future directions, decide which way to go uh, with some of these new findings. So I just want to thank again everybody uh, for their questions, and feel please please contact me with any additional questions or thoughts that you have on the topic. Okay. All right. So. Thank you. Well, okay, I think we are done with the, with the question. So uh, the post, if, if you want to continue discussing some of these ideas, uh, please join to the Zoom discussion. We are ready with, with Jeffrey and um, Adit. So yes, uh, uh, we will stay online for a few minutes. So feel free to, to join us. Okay, uh, thanks everybody for attending to or seminar and okay see you next time thanks oh nice nice talk thanks a lot so it's really exciting and a completely new new focus so i'm i'm just curious about how why why you decided to to explore more in detail the vascular activity uh I don't know. It's what what was the main motivation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I've been an amacrine cell enthusiast for a little while now. Now that we're off the YouTube, <laughs> been an amacrine enthusiast for for quite a while now. And I, I, you know, was looking for new amacrines. I, I started studying that the MAC and looking at the MAC, and we found these really interesting specializations and in association with the Mueller cells. And we were really struck by this. And it led us to look at the ultrastructural Mueller cells. It led us to look at the interactions with the blood vessels. And so Adit really took off on the Mueller ultrastructure. And we just went to both ends of the cell, you know, what are the, how do things look like at the interface with the neurons? And what do things look like at the interface with the blood vessels? And uh, so it's really the science and the discovery of those enchantments that fueled a lot of these other questions. And ultimately, we're, we're really excited about it. And I think it opened up the possibility that there's really a, a combination of amacrine cells that are really working in concert uh, to influence and possibly even control hyperemia. So um, I think it is a, an exciting kind of set of questions, a new direction. Uh, I'm really, uh, you know, new to this field. Uh, there's a couple people that have done some work on the neuron glia interaction side of things, but it, it definitely seems like there's a, a lot of nice open questions in here, you know, that we have some of the tools we need to to begin asking some of those questions. So, well, it's just been a lot just of fun. One, one point, Will, you are still on YouTube. This oh, is great. Being live stream. So, um, no, yeah, I, I we've got to, uh, I just all the conspiracy it. talk and stuff. And don't say anything bad about <laughs> Liam. Or or anything. I mean, oh, hi, Liam. <laughs> hey, Liam. All right. Hi, so, hi, yes, I, 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 I will I will cut the, the stream now. So, that's um, so, yes. So, I will end up the stream so we can continue by Zoom. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Ha, ha, ha.